this time on command centers. Um, just some announcements again before we start. Feel free to ask questions at any time. By raising your hand, you'll see a raise your hand button at the bottom of your screen or typing in your question in the Q&A chat bubble, which is found at the bottom of your screen also. So again, in the interest of time, we won't be introducing the panelists, but we do have their bios. If you click the link, which is now found in your chat pack, in the chat box, sorry. Okay, now before anything else, again, let's start with a poll to find out just how many of you have command centers. So can we share the poll, please? So here you go. Do you have a command center? Yes, a data command center. Yes, an operational command center. Not now, but setting up one. No, but thinking about setting up one. Sorry. And then the last one is no. So I'll wait for everyone to put in their votes. Okay. Just waiting for everyone to vote. Okay. Don't think the others. Okay. Um, let's end the poll and maybe share the results. So there are there are twenty two percent who have an operational command center. There are some who are setting up one, and thirty one percent no don't have a command center. So this might be a good um, segue to our panel discussion today on command centers. So let me introduce our panelists for this afternoon. First of all, um, from Tan Tok Seng, Dr. Jamie Mervyn Lin, Lim, Chief Operating Officer, Tan Tok Seng. So, hi, Dr. Jamie. Hi, good afternoon. They have, they have the first and only Asian command center today. And of course, Dr. Stephen Ayer, Executive Director, Medical Services of Royal Hobart Hospital in Tasmania, Australia. Hi, Dr. Stephen. Hello. Special guest for this afternoon, Dr. Yunis Mohammed Amin Kazim, CEO of Dubai Health Corporation, Dubai Health Authority. Dr. Yunis, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Yunis. And of course, last but not the least, Dr. Karen Barbara Carbone, advisor to the CEO of Dubai Health Authority. Hi, Dr. Bobby. Good afternoon. Great. Thanks very much for joining us again, um, for joining us this afternoon. So before anything else, it will probably help to make sure that we're all on the same page. So Dr. Jamie, may I ask you to define what is a command center? Um, well, I, I suppose um, I will use an analogy and I'll use an, an airport control tower as an analogy. Um, as you know, the airport control tower basically provides visibility to the air traffic controller with regards to the flights coming in, those that are outgoing and those that are still uh, on land. And therefore, a command center that we have at Tan Tok Seng Hospital is really like the airport control tower. Uh, using different sensors on the ground, it provides management with the visibility and real-time information of what is happening on the ground uh, so that important decisions can be made with regard to choke points, deployment of resources, etc. And, and it really functions as the brain of the entire organization. So that's, that's broadly what the command center is all about. Great, Dr. Jamie, thank you. And um, Dr. Yunis, what is the scope and authority of uh, Dubai's command center, Dubai Health Authority's command center? Actually, it's uh, not uh, very far from what is Jimmy, and almost it is uh, the same as the Emirate of Dubai with the population of 4 million. A uh, part of that, uh, we are actually, uh, is we are seven Emirates. Uh, Dubai is the second uh, biggest uh, Emirate from the whole United Arab Emirate. Uh, with this, uh, and this is the scope is uh, of the command center in Dubai is in cooperation with the federal authorities, inclusive of uh, recommendations regarding population, entry and airport and seaport, regulations regarding social distancing, masks mm -hmm. and treatment protocols, strategies regarding school uh, gathering. 
The Dubai Health Authority Command Center Authority is to rec recommend a cohesive uh, plan to the higher authorities for approval and implement the plan and measures report results as well. We undergo continuous uh, performance improvement as a result. Okay, thank you, Dr. Yunis. So you were referring more to really the entire um, Dubai, right? Um, what about for um, Dr. Air? Dr. Air, what, what's the scope and authority of your command center in Royal Hobart Hospital? Well, uh, Royal Hobart um, Hospital is, um, is, is, is quite a uh, small hospital compared with uh, my colleagues on the uh, teleconference today. Um, we're only around 500 beds and we're serving a population uh, as a tertiary hospital of around half a million people. Um, so the scope of our uh, uh, command centre is, or our integrated operations centre we call it, is really a ma uh, managing pretty much as Jamie described, uh, the patient flow in the uh, hospital and the movement of patients and access to uh, the inpatient beds and to our theatres and our critical care services uh, within the hospital. Right, and can you share also a bit about the components of your command centre? Um, well, the components of the uh, command centre really are um, uh, focused on patient flow. So our patient flow staff uh, uh, um, are there. Our nursing director patient flow managers there. Our clinical stream uh, directors uh, move in, in and out of the uh, command centre, depending on the uh, issues uh, that are currently occurring. And uh, there are a number of other staff that are also uh, based in the, uh, in the command centre. Um, the command centre is, is quite a small uh, command centre compared with uh, uh, Jamie's uh, command centre. Uh, however, you know, our approach is really around providing that safe patient access and flow, um, the identification of patients at risk, uh, detecting any problems within our system, any risks and bottlenecks to that flow, and really moving resources around the organisation. So, for example, if there are uh, there is a bottleneck in access to beds related to cleaning, for example, it's to um, allocate uh, resources there. So it's really the nerve centre uh, for our hospital in managing our overall patient movements uh, within the hospital. Right. Can can we just show the other photos? Yeah. The yeah, these so, are the um, with our, our uh, integrated operations centre, we have a number of data boards uh, which we use uh, to uh, guide uh, the overall decision making. Um, this, for example, is, a, is an example of our emergency data board and each one of those dots is a patient uh, who's been waiting. Uh, at that time, it shows that there are 20 bed, beds requested from a total of uh, 62 patients in the area and we have four ambulances waiting to um, offload. Next right. slide. Um, so this is an example of our COVID um, board. Um, we, uh, in, in uh, Tasmania, we're very fortunate. Uh, we've only got one active case uh, in our half a million population there in uh, one of our hospitals, uh, not at the Royal Hobart. But this shows us uh, in real time our patients who have been COVID tested, where they're located within the organisation, um, our patients who are in quarantine, because we have patients returning from other states and uh, from other areas where they need to do the 14 day quarantine period before they're free within the hospital. Uh, and it uh, shows the patients that have already been tested within our organisation. So this is in real time providing us uh, with this data. Uh, we also have, um, there's a subset of this data that shows the whole state and the other uh, three hospitals uh, combined in, in that sense. Okay. And Great. the last slide I think is just a really quick illustration of our um, integrated operations centre. Uh, nowhere near the size of uh, Jamie's, but it gives you an idea of a bank of uh, 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 screens with uh, desks and uh, people sitting uh, monitoring and using their computers to communicate throughout the organisation. And then there's a meeting room attached for any, uh, any emergent uh, 
uh, meetings that need to happen to discuss patient flow issues within the organisation. So it's a very small uh, integrated operations centre. Right. Okay, Dr. Stevens, thank you very much. What about Dr. Jamie? What about for Tan Tok Sen? What is the scope and authority of um, your command centre here in Singapore? So, so for Tan Tok Sen, we we run a regional health system. Mm -hmm. uh, whereby we look after the health of a population that resides around the hospital. And, and we look after a population of about 1.4 to 1.5 million Singaporeans. Uh, the Tan Tok Seng campus itself, uh, we are in a very unique position because the Singapore National Center for Infectious Diseases is part of Tan Tok Seng Hospital. So we are really at the forefront in the, in the war against COVID-19. Uh, as a campus, we run about 2,000 beds, of which about 330 of them falls under the National Center for Infectious Diseases. So you can imagine the context of, of our operations, and the command center plays a very important role by providing us the visibility of the end-to-end -end care of the patient. And what we have done over the years was to build up capabilities for, for this command center. Uh, we started off with a peacetime module. A peacetime module essentially helps us to better manage the patient's admissions, the clinic workflows. And now in times of a disease outbreak, uh, we have added on modules which are relevant to the whole COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the whole idea is to build capabilities. So peacetime, outbreak mode, and then we want to add on capabilities like supply chain, uh, video analytics, and also predictive capabilities. Uh, what, what we really want to do is to move the command center from the early stage of just visualization of data to one where it's able to bring about uh, decision support capabilities and then eventually moving into more autonomous operations, where most of the day-to-day -day operations can be automated uh, via this command center. So that is what, what the command center at Tantok Singh is capable of doing. Great, thanks Dr. Jamie. And um, just going back to Dubai Health Authority, doc, Dr. Bobby, uh, what are the components of your, your strategic and operational command center? The challenges you face as well? Okay, so as Dr. Yunus said, uh, our command center covers the entire Emirate of Dubai. So just in context to realize the public hospitals and clinics are only 30% of the healthcare delivered in Dubai. 70% of the healthcare is delivered by the private sector. Mm -hmm. So our command center had to be very strategic in terms of overseeing the entire healthcare of the Emirates. So what we did is we developed seven functional teams. We had a team that just focused strictly on screening of the population and laboratory testing. We had a team on the supply chain and logistics, treatment and protocol and capacity management, contact tracing and bed management. Team number five was on the communications. Team number six was data management. And team number seven was um, the finance management. And these teams develop regulations, policies, procedures, as well as, as the operational management, particularly in contact tracing and bed management. So what were our challenges? We had two major challenges. Obviously, there are a lot of issues that happened every day, but hmm. the challenge was relative to manpower. You know, we had to not only um, uh, support the labor of the command center in terms of all the bed management, contact tracing, et cetera, functions. And we also then had to en enhance and increase our skilled labor to manage the patient population. Because obviously, as, as things happened, um, we had increased acuity, et cetera. So we, um, through innovative strategies of having a website um, that we created a volunteering website we were able to manage our command center through volunteers of people that were no longer functioning and because of their areas had stopped during uh, the COVID. And to manage the um, patient population, we retrained healthcare workers um, so that they could manage the higher community. And we moved um, public and private, um, we, we consolidated public and private labor. So it was very, very um, collaborative. The second major 
challenge that we faced was around data, which, you know, which is a major focus of command centers. Because of the fact that, again, we manage 30% and the private sector manage 70%, we have a lot of disparate um, systems that we needed to understand the, the continuum across the emirate. So we emergently set up online data entry systems and developed software systems to support it. And we're now in the process of automation. And, and so we're actually took it strategic to operational where I see my colleagues have really done a lot of the data management and, mm -hmm. and go back to operational and strategic the other way. Great. Thanks, Dr. Bobby. And I think we have one question here before I move on to the other questions. Uh, this is to Dr. Air again. Please, um, you can raise your hand or you can type in your question. Please feel free. Um, Dr. Air, I don't know if you see this from Praveer Dutta. May, um, was the command center prepared locally or um, by a third party vendor? Yeah. Yeah, the, um, um, it, it essentially was local. There were discussions previously um, that I've been involved in with GE Healthcare. Uh, around their command center uh, rollout uh, models. Uh, and they were based on the Johns Hopkins model, um, which I think, uh, you know, essentially was one of the very early um, uh, command centers. And uh, Jamie uh, or um, uh, Eunice or, or Karen may actually be able to um, uh, sort of clarify that. But um, no, we, we actually looked at other command centers and integrated operations centers that were functioning and, uh, and, and sort of really tried to pick the best bits out uh, for our own and, and took that forward there as, a, as our, our own internal management. Right. Okay. Um, Dr. Jamie, how much does your, how much space does your command center take up? And the reason I ask is because when I look at the command centers in the US, they occupy something like 12,000 square feet. So the, the command center at Tan Tok Sing is about 140 square meters. Um, that is slightly larger than the 12,000 square feet that you were talking about. But I think what's more important is really to look at the function of the command okay. center. And, and the command center at Tan Tok Sing um, has a capacity of about 40 to 45 seats. Um, and these are actually predetermined seating uh, in preparation for a crisis. So if there is, say, a disease outbreak or a civil emergency, actually many of these seats already have predetermined uh, individuals to be seated at mm -hmm. those locations. So an example would be the director of my supply chain, or the director of pharmacy, for example, the, the commander of the command center has a seat in the command center as well. And uh, during a peacetime mode, actually about three quarters of the command center is empty. Uh, on a peacetime mode, about 10, 10 individuals man the command center doing various functions, but we are prepared for an outbreak or for a civil emergency. And that is why the space is prepared for, for such an event. Right. Okay. There's another question here um, for Dr. Jamie or Dr. Eyre. When the command center started in your in your hospitals, did it focus solely initially to just monitoring patient flow? And currently, what other functions did you add along the way? I think you answered, well, if you want to answer it again, I think this was answered uh, earlier. But the question was, um, when you set up the command center, was it solely for monitoring patient flow? Or what other functions did you add along the way? Um, perhaps I let uh, Jamie go first. Yeah, but, um, yeah that's fine. Dr. Jamie, so yeah. It, 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 is, it is a journey that we have embarked on. You know, the command center didn't happen overnight. And uh, it has been a, a journey of about close to a, close to a decade, I would say. Uh, we, we started off, of course, with a, a major challenge of a very high bed occupancy and patients waiting for a very long time at the emergency department uh, you know, waiting to be admitted and during those times the way to facilitate an admission was was calling the wards jotting down 
the occupancy on a piece of paper. And we call that the paper, pen, and phone era, you know, where we have to call up to find what's happening upstairs in the ward. And, and that was really the, the early days of, you know, seeding the idea of a command center. And, and to answer the question, therefore, yes, uh, it, it arose out of that. We wanted to look at how to better optimize the flow of the patient. We wanted mm -hmm. to look at how we can better optimize resources in the hospital because we, we wouldn't know where the empty beds are, where the vacant beds are, which beds are being turned around by the housekeepers. And I think those are issues which, which create bottleneck in the entire flow of the patient. But over the years, we have therefore built on those capabilities. Uh, we have built on patient flow to start looking at supply chain, uh, looking at analytics as well. So we wanted to build in capabilities so that it's not just visualization of data, but it's also what is the data telling us? And mm. is there an algorithm behind you know, the command center or an artificial intelligence that is able to tell us you know, what, what's going to happen predictively over the next five to six hours. And that gives us the ability to pre-plan um, in terms of uh, an influx of patients. And that gives us the ability to better recall or optimize our manpower resources in order to meet, say, a, a very high bed occupancy that is coming up over the weekend. Mm. So that, that was how you know, the whole command center evolved over the years. It didn't happen overnight. Was it very different from your experience, Dr. Eyre? Uh, no, I think that's, um, that, that's often um, where the origin of the integrated operations centres are uh, associated with patient flow and often bottlenecks and uh, long waits uh, for beds uh, within organisations. And of course, uh, you know, the increased drive to efficiency and uh, the contraction of the bed uh, um, bed availability within organisations and, and you know we've got also got a, um, an ageing population which is uh, requiring more hospitalisation very much that sort of drives the efficient you know the need for more efficiency which is really what the integrated operations centre um, offers. I think um, I was really interested in Jamie's uh, uh, integration I guess of his operations centre with his emergency operations centre because we have we separate ours out and uh, so, so that the hospital can still function uh, and, and reports into the emergency operations centre. But I can see how, uh, you know, that uh, cohesive data um, integration would be really nice when you're managing an emergency in your, um, in, in your organisation. And of course, we're all dealing with an emergency at the moment uh, with the, you know, with the COVID uh, situation. Mm. And, uh, uh, you know, so our emergency operations centre sort of functioned basically for three months and we, we've, we've shut it down now and now we're back into a more business as usual um, function. But I thought that was an interesting, uh, an interesting way of thinking about it and having the capacity to expand your um, operations centre to include uh, the emergency response components. Yeah, and, and that came in very useful during the COVID-19 outbreak because um, within the campus, we actually have two very distinct buildings. One is the Tan Tok Seng Hospital building. The other is the National Center for Infectious Diseases. Uh, it is managed by the same management team. And the original idea was to contain any outbreak in the National Center for Infectious Diseases so that the business as usual can continue with the main hospital. Mm. Um, but you know, COVID-19 has taught us a very different lesson. We were planning based on the SARS experience where it was low numbers and high mortality. Mm. But COVID-19 is just the opposite. It was high numbers, low mortality. Mm -hmm. And what happened uh, during the last couple of months was that we actually have to overflow patients from National Center for Infectious Diseases to the main hospital. And we also had to pull doctors from the main hospital to look after patients in the National Center for Infectious Diseases. And, and, and I think that's where an integrated op center became very useful because we were able to see the operations on both sides 
it's a, it's a zero sum game essentially because your resources are finite, your consumables are finite. So where you put your resources in order to attend to the most urgent cases, I think that's the critical decision. And the command center provides that bird's eye view of where the needs are at that point in time and for management to make that decision eventually. Right. So um, there is a question I did want to ask about the minimum requirement of um, information systems in setting up a command center, right? And there's, I think, well, there's a question here from Francis Lopez. What are the units to focus on if a hospital wants to create a one command system? So before that, though, um, I guess, Dr. Ayer, sorry, can you just let us, I mean, what is the minimum requirement? for um of what what yeah information systems to set up a command center uh look i, I mean i think um you know moving from that um page, uh, paper uh pen and phone era uh it really is the data sources that uh sort of support uh your operations center your command center i mean i think a patient administration system is a must a bed management system is a must and sometimes mm -hmm. they're integrated uh, I would add a uh, theatre management system and also sometimes the emergency department systems are separated from your normal inpatient uh, system. So I think with those four systems uh, or four um, uh, uh, um, components, I guess, uh, and some of those may be in the same uh, information system uh, or they need to be integrated and that's how we've um, brought our systems together in our focus boards to integrate the data that's available and provide the um, meaningful uh, 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 information. Great, thank you. I hope that answers uh, uh, Francis Lopez's question on what you need to focus to set up a command center. I think those are the steps and what types of um, management systems to input in the hospital. Um, Dr. Yunis, just die, um, changing tone a bit, but asking you about the um, various stakeholders, because I think Dubai had had to deal with a lot of agencies as well, how everyone reacted to it and how everyone was able to adapt to the system quite quickly. Actually, uh, this uh, pandemic is uh, one of that, uh, which is of course there is a, because of the severity of the pandemic and how it's been involved the worldwide. But there is also one of the most uh, uh, remarkable experience of this horrible pandemic was that our people banded together. And this was very clearly being seen between the private sector hospitals institute and the public hospitals working together as one institute. Not only that, the health sector also that sharing with other authorities like police department, uh, tourist department, municipality, all they are working as one team. This is what's really, this is one of the wonderful experience, uh, what is we, are, we lived that and this was appeared that there, will, there was a sort of uh, donated uh, hotels for uh, isolation, there will be also helping us from the police department for the adhering the, and compliance of the, all the regulations one by one. And, and actually, it is, uh, even the hotel was being used as isolation. Uh, so building was donated. So the expansion of the volume was remarkable. Uh, so the adoption of the quick because of the focus, all because we are focusing for the safety of our people. Okay, and um, thank you very much, Dr. Yunis. Dr. Jamie, what about in a hospital setting? How were you able to convince uh, the staff and the different stakeholders in the hospital to adapt to uh, the command center? Um, we, we started out with very early engagement, and I think that is very important. So during the development stage of the command center, we were already engaging the different departments who would either be feeding data to the command center or who will be using the command center uh, as part of their day-to-day -day operations. And I think that's important because if you look at flow, patient flow, 
uh, you need to be able to have information that makes sense from one point moving to the next point, the next touch point in the entire system. And, and different departments have different objectives. They have different, um, they have different data points of interest. And it is therefore important that we are able to align the different stakeholders so that we are all on the same page. And the data points, when you join them together, make sense. It helps to paint a more coherent picture of what is happening on the ground. So I, I would say that the engagement started right in the beginning, uh, so that when the command center is up and running, everybody has already been bought into the command center. They knew what they were looking at and, and they won't quibble over the data. See, what, one of the biggest challenges people will quibble over the data. The data is not clean. It doesn't reflect what's happening on the ground. So if you engage them early, they can't say that, right? We, we are all in alignment with regard to data flow. And I think we have time. So I just wanted to ask Dr. Ayer um, if they had a very different or similar experience. Oh, no, I think um, absolutely. I mean, the first thing uh, uh, medical staff certainly do is uh, query the data uh, and, uh, you know, um, making sure that there is a comfort with the data. But I think the big um, issue for stakeholders is what's in it for me. And, uh, you know, when uh, our clinicians can see that uh, the patients are actually moving more quickly into uh, the inpatient areas, uh, their uh, patient satisfaction is higher. Uh, you know, these are really sort of positive selling points that uh, often get the stakeholders over, over the line. Uh, yeah. So let me just turn to the questions here. We have a couple in the chat box, or now three. Um, for a single hospital, do you think it is worthwhile to run a command center and improve hospital workflow? And what sort of minimal data set should we start monitoring? Um, Dr. Jamie? Well, I, I would say that if we go purely on uh, dollars and cents, it's, it's going to be very challenging. Um, it, is, it is going to be very expensive to wire up the entire hospital to pool data. But I would also say that data is very exciting. You know, and as a management staff, you will want to see as much information as you can because it, it gives you a sense of what's happening on the ground. But I would advise that we sort of take a step back and to really understand why we want a command center. Uh, what are the data that we want to monitor? And why do you want to monitor that? I think that's the more important question. So if you think that your hospital has a challenge with regard to admissions, with regard to patient flow, then maybe that is a good starting point to start off with. You, you may not need all the other information pulling from, from the other systems. So address where your pain points are and, and start from there. The next level question really is, so after you know the data, you know, then what's next, right? What are the action plans that you're going to put in? How are you going to address the choke points uh, in the hospital? And I think if you are able to address those questions, then, you know, the outcome of a, a more optimized hospital, a more efficiently run hospital, and of course, safer patient care, um, that would sort of justify the cost of why you need a command center. And it doesn't need to be a huge command center. It can, it can start with a small unit and then to build capabilities over the years. So I think a related question to that, uh, there were two questions on ROI. Dr. Ayer, uh, what is the baseline ROI that you set out to achieve for the hospital command center? And a okay. similar one, by which, time, by which time does a hospital get an ROI on such an investment? Oh, I think, um, you, you know, we, um, our experience is the return on investment is uh, pretty much as soon as you're operational because it is about um, integrating the uh, silos within your organisation so that uh, the silos work together uh, and, uh, you know, so that the uh, surgical services are just as much oriented around the waiting times in the emergency department. Uh, so. The patient ROI, if you like to think of it that way, that patient safety, we do know uh, that reducing the uh, length of time in the emergency department improves the uh, uh, safety and the outcomes for patients. 
patients who stay long periods of time in, the, in emergency departments uh, while they're waiting for beds do uh, uh, worse in the longer term from the point of view of their uh, hospitalisation. They cost more, they stay in hospital longer. Uh, so I think, you know, the ROI question is an interesting one. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I think, uh, you know, picking up on Jamie's point in starting small and um, developing and building and adding the components, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, is, is a really sensible, uh, is a sensible way to uh, proceed. Uh, because the opportunities will come from the point of view of uh, people being involved and seeing what uh, can actually uh, uh, be achieved in, in pulling all this information together to actually oversight the management of your hospital. So um, I, I'm not sure that's answered the ROI question probably um, very well, but um, you know, I, I think it is, you know, the ROI is really around patient care and the quality of care that we provide. Right. And um, there's a question here, are there insights that you got through consolidating the command center? I wanted to ask um, Dr. Yunus or Dr. Bobby first, um, by building up a strategic operational command center versus not having one, um, you know, what was it, I mean, what insights, what new insights did you get? Or I guess it's helped with, yeah. So, well, I first want to talk to the participants because you can start command centers without having significant data. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that our strategic command center really unified the entire emirate through common regulations, through common policies, when to test patients, when not to test patients, how are we going to handle our schools. So there's a lot of things that you can do as a control and command center it doesn't necessarily only be driven by data. So I think people need to realize a command center can be strategic. Mm -hmm. um, data adds a tremendous amount of value though, uh, in terms of real time movements as it related for us for bed management, capacity management, those kind of things. But in terms of looking back and looking forward, um, we, you know, we have an ongoing disaster management plan. Dubai always um, has a disaster plan. And that disaster plan brings up this command center. But what we did realize is that, as I see from our colleagues, Dr. Ayers and, and Dr. Jamie, that um, you know, having this data command center may be of value. And so our learnings from this is we're working to integrate our data across the public private sector and make our data systems from uh, the data entry systems to real time data systems. So that was the biggest learning is we've got the strategic control. We now really need to manage the operations with real-time data. Right. And um, just another question here before I go back to um, the questions that we have prepared, but what is the difference between a hospital information system to the command center? Anyone? The difference between a hospital, I think the hospital information system is vital to the command center, isn't it? It's, yes, Dr. I, I, can answer, I can answer from a health system perspective or an Emirate perspective. When you have multiple hospitals in a command center, you need to have a common enterprise uh, database. You need to have a common enterprise number. And that's one of the things that we're working on. If you're doing this within framework of a hospital, you need the, the hospital's medical record, and that's sufficient. But when you do it across multiple hospitals, there has to be a basic infrastructure so that you can manage the patient across multiple systems through an enterprise database. Okay. And then um, would equipping the operations and clinical staff on the ground with video and audio recording capability be another way to improve situation awareness and subsequent enhancement of hospital ops through the command center? Um, Dr. Ayer? Yeah, look, I think um, uh, with the Internet of Things, um, you know, the amount of data that's available um, you know, is, is, is incredible. You know, you can actually, um, 
uh, you know, put data points and feeds uh, throughout your organisation, which can track, uh, you know, patients and staff. Now, um, we're not anywhere near uh, that sophistication in my organisation. I would think um, Jamie may actually be in, in a better position uh, around that. But uh, certainly, um, you know, the big data and the ability to um, use big data and to manage big data to uh, inform your uh, decision making and the operations of your uh, organisation, I think will be, uh, you know, uh, the future. But certainly we're not uh, there from that aspect uh, in, in our hospital here. But Jane, did you want to make any comment? Yeah, um, I, I, I suppose the command centre is only as good as the sensors on the ground to be able to feed the information back to the command centre. And um, there, are, there are many forms of sensors that you can use, you know, from the very basic cameras that you put on the ground to RTLS or RFID. So at, at Tan Tok Seng, we use the RTLS to tag our patients and also to tag equipment so we know where the equipments are in the hospital. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that helps us in managing the flow of the patients. We know where the patients are. We know whether the beds are being turned around. And we are also progressively moving into tagging the staff as well. So as part of the access tag, uh, they will hold an RTLS tag. And, and the RTLS tag helps us in terms of contact tracing, in terms of who the staff has come into contact with, for how long they come into contact with. And that's important you know, in an outbreak like this, where if there is an index case in a hospital, we know who are the staff who have come into contact with this particular patient. Mm. So Great, this thank part you. is what we have yep. done. Thank you, I Dr. Think, Jamie. Yes. Um, I mean, m most staff and patients now have mobile phones and, uh, you know, so there is the ability to use some of that uh, information also uh, in, uh, in, in managing uh, your organisation. But, you know, you do need a level of sophistication um, that, uh, you, you know, is basic to be able to achieve some of that. Okay. Dr. Yunus, there's a question here for you. How will the Dubai Health Authority incentivize private hospital um, with the command center structure? Actually, this is uh, one of the beginning challenge uh, it was, but uh, later on it was overcome and being, uh, being incentivized by the government, by covered by the, from the government. And uh, I mean, uh, and also it's not only the government will be also the contribution of the, the health insurance as well, together, working together with the government. And to be covering, I mean, this all the costs will be covered from both sides. Thank you, Dr. Yunis. So the setup of the command center um, is all shouldered by the government, basically, whether private or public. Basically, is uh, public, but in case of the required uh, involvement of uh, as private as was involved, as if needed. Okay. Okay, um, Dr. Bobby, looking back, um, how what could have been done to make the setup of your command center more straightforward? Any lessons learned from the setup of your command center? Well, I think we we discussed this a little bit a little bit in that um, instead of having it as an intermittent command center when it's activated by the disaster plan, it would be to have it much more like my colleagues, uh, Dr. Err and Dr. Jamie, in terms of having it ongoing, and and that's what we're looking, uh, forward to is to is to make this a permanent strategy for operational improvement, particularly in the public sector. Um, and having it ongoing. I think that that's the biggest lesson learned as opposed to being inter intermittent only with disasters.
the question, sorry. So yeah, my internet was just unstable just now. So I said, okay. Um, yeah, um, it seems like digitization will only increase and therefore cyber threats are an inevitable reality, right? So how do you secure your data and your network? Dr. Yunus? Actually, the data security is a high priority uh, in the Emirates, uh, and we are proud of ongoing uh, preventive strategies we have. We are constantly uh, monitoring and uh, adapting to the change and cyber threat. Always will be from the, from the government closely observing uh, any changes any threat could uh, occur. So they are, there will be, a, thankfully we have, we are proud of it that we have very strong control in that. Okay. And um, there's a question, it's, it's somewhat relevant, I think, like we were talking about, Dr. Air, you were um, talking about the use of the cell phones also for a command centers. And so there's a question here, how do you safeguard patient information by allowing st staff to use their handphones, their personal handphones? Anyone? Uh, yeah. um, that, that's a great question. Um, we do have um, a, a system within our hospital uh, called MedTasker, which uh, is an app uh, that downloads onto uh, the individual phones and any of the um, data that's exchanged in the hospital between clinicians is actually encrypted data. So it does allow them, for example, to send uh, photographs and uh, um, you know, that confidential information uh, to other clinicians. Uh, it's not accessible to anybody outside of our organisation. And so you know, it, the technology, the apps are available to uh, ensure that safety uh, in the use of, the of their uh, personal devices. Okay. And um, Dr. Jamie, there's a question here about um, involving clinicians um, in monitoring and benchmarking clinical indicators. Um, how, how have you been able to um, involve clinicians? Yeah, so um, I would say that that's not the intent of the command center. The command center is a live center that provides real-time information it doesn't drill down into quality of care uh, delivered by the clinicians. So it is, uh, it is a totally different discussion. That's not the intent. Um, but to address the engagement of clinicians uh, in terms of quality, we, we do have at a hospital level what we call a quality council. And this is one of the highest platform meetings that we, we conduct, chaired by you know, the chairman of the clinical board. And in this meeting, basically clinical information, clinical performance are all shared. And sometimes we may even mask the names of the clinicians, um, but we just show Dr. A, Dr. B, Dr. C, and masking the names and just show performance. Uh, I think the mindset is one of clinical improvement rather than being punitive. And therefore the team comes together. Uh, we look at areas where there are areas where we can improve upon and areas of good practices we, we can share with the other departments. So that's the approach for quality improvement in the hospital. But it is very delinked from a command centre because the command centre is a real-time operation centre. Right. And then um, I'm just looking at the couple of questions here. I think this was, um, you, you just answered it, but just if you can reiterate, Dr. Jamie. So, um, I guess when you, is this primarily then for operations management or senior leaders and how you can convince, if not the clinicians, how can you, how did you convince ground stakeholders about the benefits of a command center? Yes, so, so the engagement, like what I said earlier, I think the engagement right in the beginning is, is really critical. Um, the, the ground needs to understand how the command center can help them. So at the main command center, of course, we have a bird's eye view of the entire operations in the campus. But on the ground, um, the unit managers have access to their own specific modules. 
so they can look at the performance uh, and the flow within their departments. And that's very useful for them as well, you know, especially during a crisis where everybody will be asking for information. The other thing, you know, during, during a crisis is that management will always go to the ground and say, can you submit reports? Because I want to know what's happening. Can you submit on an hourly basis, two hourly basis? And the ground is very frustrated because they would say, just let me get the job done. Stop bugging me for data. <laughs> and if you can convince them that the command center can pull the data automatically, we don't have to bother you every hour. To them, that is already a huge benefit. Mm -hmm. So I think it is, it is a win-win for both. It is a win for the ground and it's also a win for management. And if we look at a consolidated set of data, which is consistent across the hospital, then it helps management to also make sense of the situation on the ground. So engagement right from the beginning is, is key to the success of the command center. Okay, thanks Dr. Jamie. We have somebody who raised her hand. I think this is a she. Gutiara um, Dwi, Yana. Um, I think my colleagues are going to unmute you now. Do you want to ask a question out loud? Ms. Mutiara? Oh, okay. You're, I think you're unmuted now. You can um, ask your question if you have a question. Mutiara Duiana. Oh, okay. Probably became shy. Because you, um, you can ask a question yeah? <laughs> out loud. Okay, just one last question before I go to my final question so we can wrap up. We're almost um, um, five o'clock. We've been here for an hour. Is it helpful connecting command centers of different hospitals to mobilize resources in the disaster context like COVID-19 pandemic? What are the pros and cons of this? Anyone? I think there's only pros really um, because uh, when you're responding to a disaster or an emergency, uh, you know, you want to have uh, the information of your whole system uh, pretty much uh, as uh, has been described by um, Dr. Eunice and, uh, and Dr. Bobby. So, I, you know, I think it, it is really a, a very positive thing in having an understanding of what's happening across the whole health system because when you're in an emergency, or when you're in a disaster sense, uh, our, the private hospitals and the nursing homes and the other components of the health system all need to come together and work together uh, to actually respond appropriately to maintain the uh, maximum uh, health of the community. So I think I can only think of uh, pros, uh, but um, perhaps my um, fellow pan panelists might be able to uh, come up with some cons. I, I echo that fully. I think there is a lot of benefit in trying to connect um, the different hospitals. And in Singapore, actually, that is the plan to build the command centers at the different hospitals uh, and also to pull it to the Ministry of Health so that they can look at the data from a national perspective. But of course, the, the granularity of the data will be very different. Um, but that is useful in terms of managing national resources um, where the PPE goes, where the medication goes, uh, and, and that's, that's important for us uh, in order to fight, say, a pandemic. Mm -hmm. yep. Dr. Yunus, you were going to say something, I think. Yes, uh, exactly, because uh, really that what is we, this is one of the, as, as I mentioned before, that uh, going working as one team, uh, it's almost, uh, it was in the practice, it, uh, all that, uh, the hospitals, it's not only the public hospitals, we are having almost four hospitals, even the private hospitals added, as Bobby mentioned, about 70% is private. So it has all been working as one unit and it was uh, and it reflected on the patient care, uh, as all of you mentioned about resources being managed, uh, capacity being managed, and also the continuation of the measures from the institute to another. We, we can have it easily managed. And the other things, any federal uh, law or guidelines, it was in practice next day without hesitant. And it was 
harmonized across the whole institute together. And it was really what has happened at this world for the benefit of the patient, of course, and the population. Thank you, Dr. Ines. Okay, so we have five minutes left, just a quick round. Um, really, I think nice way to end the session is to find out from each of you what's next. Um, what are you looking for? Maybe what innovations, what technology is lacking? Or what are you asking from industry? What's after a command center? Dr. Jamie, we start with you. Well, I, I suppose for Tan Tok Seng is to continue to build on the capabilities of the command center. Um, we want to move in terms of first real-time visibility, following which is uh, some form of decision support. And the end goal is really autonomous operations. And if I can have 80% of my, my operations done autonomously, triggered by the system, then uh, this is really what we want in terms of the Tantoxin Command Center. Thanks, Dr. Jamil. I'll go to Dr. Bobby next. Um, our goal is to have that integrated data to be able to develop predictive analytics, much like I hear from my colleagues. I mean, the ultimate goal is for those predictive analytics to be able to prevent problems. And so first we have to integrate the disparate databases and then we need to be able to add the analytics um, to prevent the problems. That's what we're working on. Thanks, Dr. Bobby. Dr. Ayer? I think uh, like Jamie, we, uh, our, our future is really uh, um, integrating more real time uh, data sources within into the operations center to give us uh, uh, the information rather than that human inter intervention. Um, however, I think um, I'd like to think that there's still a job for um, managers and for, um, I mean, I don't want to do ourselves out of a job, but um, I think there are some uh, predictive analytics uh, which will allow our funders and our uh, owners really to uh, uh, be confident, I guess, that uh, the way forward in planning and uh, and the development of services and, uh, you know, is optimized. Thank you, Dr. Ayer. Dr. Yunis. Actually, uh, I want to gather the, all what has been mentioned my, from my colleague. Why not to look into the direction of the smart uh, data, like artificial intelligence, proactively uh, analyzing the data and giving us as a trigger, alarming and alert which level of the alert will be, will be, uh, will be uh, informing and be ready for it before occurring. Thank you. And that's it. Thank you very much, Dr. Jamie, Dr. Ayer, Dr. Yunis, and Dr. Bobby for um, joining us in this discussion. Um, and obviously, thank you to uh, the attendees. Thank you for participating here. But before you go, um, we'd like to take a last poll. Can we, thank you very much, um, everyone. Okay, so this one, just the last poll, if you can help us with this. We've been talking a lot about um, digital technology, so just wanted to find out which of these digital innovations you're looking to set up in the next year. All right. And we will be, we will be sharing the results in a report. But once again, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us um, in this webinar discussion. Join us again in September. And that is going to be about cybersecurity. Thanks again, everyone, for joining.